Hey, what's up folks? It's good to be back. It's been a pretty crazy few weeks. Some of you guys may know that me and Tabitha have been in the process of moving across the Atlantic, which is hard enough without the challenges of COVID, but here we are. We've been settling in here in Clemson, South Carolina, where we'll be for the next few months, and things have been really great. We've been uh, building this studio space here. We've been recording some new music as our duo, The Foreign Landers, and I've been teaching a lot of online lessons from my fancy spaceship desk here, which has been a really rewarding thing. It's also been fun being here in Clemson again because this is where I grew up and this is where I first started playing the mandolin. It's bringing back a lot of great memories about figuring out all the little quirks about this amazing little instrument. Don't get me wrong, there were a lot of frustrating moments when I was learning the mandolin too. I didn't have a teacher when I first started and there are a lot of things that I know now that I wish I knew back then. Things that would have made my life a whole lot easier. So that's why I decided to make this video. I want to share with you my top 10 beginner tips on mandolin technique. But really these tips aren't just for beginners, a lot of these are concepts that I keep coming back to again and again to recenter as I continue to progress on this instrument. If you're new here, thanks for hitting like and subscribe, and check out my Patreon page for a lot more mandolin stuff like this. Alright, now grab your mandolin and let's get started. So these first couple of tips have to do with how to hold the mandolin. Tip number one is find your relaxed posture. Tension is going to be your main opponent for all of these tips, and it's really important to establish a natural posture before moving on to any other concepts. The main thing is you want the mandolin to feel comfortable on your person. And while everyone is different, here are a few things that have worked for me that might work for you too. While sitting down, I like to hold the mandolin between my legs with my forearm pressing against the top of the instrument towards my stomach. That way you should be able to keep the mandolin in place without having to hold up the neck with your left hand. When standing with the strap, I want the mandolin to be situated on my body at about the same position it was when I was sitting down. That way I'm not having to change anything about my technique from one to the other. Also, I try to have my hands meet the mandolin naturally. A good way to practice this posture is by letting your arms go limp by your sides and then slowly rise up to meet the instrument. You'll find that if you keep the neck forward a little bit, your left arm will meet the neck naturally without having to twist your shoulders. For the left hand, it's important to keep your fingers slanted over at about a 45 degree angle and avoid choking up on the neck too much. Try just pinching the fingerboard between the bottom joint of your index finger and the top joint of your thumb, just like you might hold a pencil. You also want the tip of your thumb to be peeking over the top of the fretboard. I think by allowing a space between the back of the neck and the crook of your thumb, you're gonna have the best reach and the best leverage. You can even push against the back of the neck with your thumb as a nice counterweight to hold the strings down. For melody playing, I always keep my left hand wrist straight. Very rarely I'll bend my wrist to accommodate for certain chords, but whenever I flex my wrist in either direction, it always introduces more tension, so I try to avoid that as much as possible. And while juggling all these things, I really try to keep my back straight and my shoulders level. By hunching over or by raising your shoulders up, you're actually creating more work for your body, which introduces tension, which can travel down your arms and negatively impact your playing. Whenever I feel this tension, it really helps me to imagine a string attached to the top of my head pulling up towards the ceiling while the rest of my body relaxes and lets gravity take hold. All right, <laughs> that's probably more than one tip, but I promise this next one's super easy. Tip number two is angle the neck. I think most people get a better sound out of the mandolin when they raise the neck to a 30 or 45 degree angle. That way when you move the pick down and up, you're not meeting the strings with the flat side of the pick. And that takes us directly to our next tip. The next few points are all about the right hand, and tip number three is find your natural pick grip. Now there's not just one right way to hold the pick, and I'm even hesitant to give you advice here because the pick grip is such a personal thing. Depending on how you hold the pick, it will have a huge impact on your sound as a mandolinist. The main consideration, as I mentioned, is to not play with the pick flat against the strings. This will cause more of a plasticky, metallic, bright sound instead of the dark, natural wood tone of the instrument. The best way to avoid this unwanted tone is to play with the knife edge of the pick instead of the flat part. And if you're angling the neck up, this should happen naturally. From the player's perspective, the left edge of the pick should be making contact with the strings on downstrokes and the right edge on upstrokes. Unless you've got a crazy inverted thumb like John Reichman, which would mean the opposite. But for the rest of us mere mortals, if you use this technique at about the bottom end of the fretboard, this should give you a good tone to work with. 
For further study on the pick grip, probably the best thing to do is to figure out who your favorite players are and try to emulate their right hands. If you can copy the way that their right hand looks, chances are you'll be able to copy their sound a lot better too. And why not learn from the best, right? You can take little bits and pieces from your favorite players to create something unique to you. But if you're interested in my approach, I'll break it down for you here. All I do is place the top right corner of this triangle pick on the side of the last joint of my index finger, and then I place my thumb across the top edge. I try to keep my thumb straight while pressing down on the top of the pick while the rest of my fingers curl up naturally underneath. That way I can keep a firm but relaxed grip. From the back angle, you can see that I have a lot of the picks showing, right? Two out of the three corners are visible, and then on the front, one of the three corners is visible. And I think by having this much of the pick exposed, it really increases your sensitivity to be able to feel where the pick makes contact with the strings in order to follow through, which is super important. And that brings us to tip four, which is feel the strings. When I play through a set of strings, I'm not tentatively feeling around in the dark for them, and I'm not swinging blindly at them either. I think both of those approaches can lead to poor tone, poor volume, and poor accuracy. Instead, I wanna confidently feel where the exact moment is that the pick makes contact with the strings in order to move through both of the strings in the set without any buzzing, bouncing, or stopping. Just one fluid motion. An analogy I like to give is this feeling of moving your hand underwater. You know, it almost feels like you're moving in slow motion because you have this smooth, consistent resistance. There's no starting or stopping or jerking motions happening. And that's exactly what you want your right hand to feel like. Imagine that the pick is just an extension of your right hand and the strings are nothing but water. A great way to practice this feeling is by using what some people call rest strokes. This is where you push through both the strings in the set and allow the pick to stop or rest on the next adjacent set of strings. You can do this for both down and up strokes. Obviously, when we're playing at normal tempos, we don't have time to stop in between every pick stroke like this, but it's still a great way to slow things down and to get inside this fluid motion mindset. But all this really boils down to where the locomotion for the pick movement is actually coming from, right? Hence our next point, which is tip number five, use your wrist and your forearm. Okay, so this tip might raise some eyebrows because there are some mandolin players who are way better than me who say and do otherwise. And this approach might not be for everyone, but playing this way has opened up a lot of new possibilities for me, and I wanna make my case for you to try it too. So a lot of people will plant the bottom of the wrist behind the bridge on the strings as a fixed point of reference to know where the strings are as they're playing. But whenever I would try to do this, my arm almost felt claustrophobic because of the stationary position, which made me tense up, which made me play worse. Also, by keeping your wrist in the same spot, you're actually changing the angle of your pick as you move from one string to the next, which is going to create some inconsistencies in your tone and your volume. And though you may have more accuracy, you do lose some potential for power by not using those bigger muscles that are in your forearm. On the other end of the spectrum, players who just use their forearm exclusively or who lock their wrists by placing their fingers on the face of the instrument, it seems like they lose some of that sensitivity to the strings that we talked about earlier. There's some other pitfalls like maybe hitting open strings that you don't mean to or having some tension arise in your elbow, so watch out for that too. And maybe it's just my fault for not sticking either of these approaches out and seeing what the possibility is, but the long-term solution for me was combining both of these techniques to get the best of both worlds. My approach is to use the forearm as the main force that drives the pick through the string, while the wrist is still in action as the precision tool to feel where the strings are and to follow through for the best tone. And for my point of reference, I use both my armrest, which I place on my forearm at the same spot every time I play, and as a floating reference, I brush behind the bridge on those strings with my wrist without having to fix it in the same place. Try it out and let me know what you think. And this is another concept where it's really helpful to study up on other players. Experiment with a bunch of different approaches and see what works best for you. And lastly on the right hand is tip number six, which is use the correct pick directions, which is such an important concept that I made a separate video just about this one topic. If you wanna be able to play in time at faster tempos, and to be able to use the right rhythmic accents, it's so important to line up the downstrokes with the beats in the measure. But you can hear my whole spiel about it at the link above. Moving on to the left hand now, and uh, you know, there's a lot of folks who love talking about the right hand for good reason, because the right hand is in charge of a lot of musical aspects of our playing, like our tone, our timing, our volume, and a bunch of other stuff. But if the left hand is overlooked and isn't doing what it's supposed to do, then none of that's gonna matter. 
To make sure we're playing the right notes, let's get some mechanics out of the way with tip number seven, use the correct finger spacing. Most of us spend the majority of our time on the mandolin in what's called the first position. This is the space between your open strings and the seventh fret. And in this area, I like to think about each finger having two frets of territory to cover. So basically in this position, my index will play any note that happens on frets one and two, my middle finger on frets three and four, my ring on five and six, and my pinky on seven and on rare occasions, eight. Keeping consistent fingerings like this is really important for building up muscle memory, which will help you perform whatever you've been practicing. But there are some exceptions to this rule to watch out for, such as playing chromatic passages on adjacent frets, playing in uncommon keys like F sharp major or D flat major, or even shifting up the neck will change things. But for the most part, this concept will keep you on the right path. Next, let's think about some finer points of the left hand with tip number eight. Place your fingers directly under the frets. One big thing that the left hand is solely responsible for is sustain. And the mandolin doesn't have much sustain to begin with, so you wanna make sure that every note counts. The first consideration with sustain is making sure that there isn't any buzzing or muting when you fret notes with your left hand. And by placing the very tip of your finger directly beneath the fret that you want, you're gonna get the best leverage to be able to hold down the string for as long as you need to with the right pressure. I try to keep all the knuckles on my fingers bent like this so that I'm playing with the tip of my finger and the pad of my finger isn't hitting any of the other strings and causing muting too. I'm also very careful not to lift up my finger too soon before I'm ready to play the next note, which would cause a break between the notes. It's really important to make each note connected to the next. And one way that I ensure that this happens is by keeping my fingers down on the fretboard for as long as possible, even when ascending to other notes. See what I mean on this G major scale. I can even plan ahead when descending the scale and place all three fingers down on the string at once. So as soon as I lift up one finger, the next finger is ready to go to make sure that the sound keeps going. The left hand is also just as much rhythmically responsible as the right, which brings us to tip number nine, which is keep your fingers close to the fretboard. Travel time is a huge factor for the left hand, and if your fingers are further away from the fretboard when you're not using them, it's gonna increase your risk for getting to the note late, which is gonna cause buzzing and shaky timing. That's why I try to keep my fingers as close to the fingerboard as I can, so all four fingers should be ready to go at a moment's notice, no matter what. I even try to use as little motion as possible to prevent my fingers from being tempted to fly too far away. It also helps create this economy of motion where your fingers aren't having to work any harder than they need to. All right, last tip here, and this one takes into account all the tips we've talked about so far. Tip number 10 is coordinate your hands together. I think it's crazy that we go into so much detail about each hand separately and then just hope that our hands are gonna sync up automatically. This unfortunately doesn't work for most of us, and if your hands aren't lining up, it's gonna create a lot of headaches for you. But there's a simple solution that I found. Instead of trying to treat your hands as equals in this situation, I found that it's way easier to establish a hierarchy between your hands. Basically, I make my left hand be the leader for my right hand. Or in other words, whenever I deliberately place my left hand finger at the correct fret at the correct time, that's the trigger response for my right hand to follow through the strings with the pick. That way there shouldn't be any chance for disconnect between the two. Go ahead, try it out on a familiar tune or a familiar scale. I'd love to hear what this does for you. You know, when I realized this for the first time, it was kind of a big light bulb moment and it cleared up a lot of stuff for me automatically. I hope that's your experience too. And whenever I continue to have issues with this, all I have to do is recenter on this one idea. Well, there you go. I hope these 10 tips were helpful for you. And just a blanket disclaimer here, these tips aren't standardized, but I think they're good starting places for most people. Like I said earlier, there isn't just one right way of playing the mandolin. And that's kind of a cool thing. It's what makes every mandolin player sound unique and individual because everyone has a different approach. And as you progress on the mandolin, your technique is gonna evolve to match your personal taste. Ultimately, I have two personal criteria for whatever technique that I settle on. First, does it sound good? And second, does it feel good? And I think that'll be a good guide for you too. Okay, so tons to work on here, but if you're looking for even more, head over to my Patreon page at the link above. You'll find a bunch of other mandolin stuff that you won't get here, so check it out. And be on the lookout for more mandolin videos soon. I'll see you guys then.